Welcome to episode two of All Across Canada, brought to you by Mayflower Sports. Uh, we're super excited to bring you this episode. A lot of stuff happened since our first recording. Uh, two big trades as the Atlas uh, fully declare rebuild. And we're going to preview the expansion draft on Thursday, March 11th for the Cannons Lacrosse Club. And we're going to go through our individual mock drafts and compare and discuss. First, we'd just like to say thanks to all the response we've received so far. Um, it's really been thrilling for us to see a lot of people interested in what we're trying to offer and uh, and bring to the lacrosse community. Yeah, like Neil said, the response has just been fantastic so far, like uh, more so than I probably would have imagined. Uh, big shout out to uh, Andrew and Jake at uh, Game of Inches podcast. They're the guys who started Mayflower Sports for really kind of helping us get going. They helped us with a lot of the, the technical issues that we had for uh, first week's episode. Uh, make sure you check out their podcast, Game of Inches. They just had Cabby on this week. That was a really, really good interview. He's such a charismatic guy. But make sure you check that out. That's a really good one. Their show's awesome. Um, and yeah, no, we had a lot of really great responses from people who who were reaching out to us and saying they want to come on the show as a guest. Like we, and they were, These are all guys that we had already earmarked before we started this as, as potential guests to come on and join us and super excited to know like that they're just, just that willing to come on and and share their stories which is what we're trying to do and uh, if anyone out there's listening and that you want to come on the show like it doesn't matter your experience with lacrosse and we just want to hear your stories your opinions your we just want to know what uh what you got to say so everybody's welcome to come on and you just have to reach out to either one of us or the guys at mayflower and we can we can try to set it up it's going to take us a few uh, a few episodes. We're probably going to do two or three more uh, without guests, so we get uh, sort of sorted out with all the technical stuff. Like we are new to this, but we're super excited to start to get that that part of the show rolling, and uh, we're ready to talk about all the stuff that happened this week, uh, NLL, PLL news across the board. So, Neil, uh, what's on the slate for today? Yeah, just to just to add to what you had, like I think it's really thrilling that uh, people want to share their stories uh, like at the end of the day like that's what sports is, is just watching these stories unfold uh so it really inspires us to just uh bring a be better episode every week so that's what we're looking to do and yeah let's get into it yeah like the one thing we uh we both talked about this we miss about uh plan is like the locker room and like the camaraderie the story so we get more guys in there and kind of get that uh, that flowing it's going to be real exciting when that happens. So hopefully everybody sticks around, enjoys the show. And uh, when we get there, that's going to be uh, even better, even better content, even more fun episodes. So all right, looking forward to keep, keeping this going. Yeah. All right. So Atlas Rebuild, two big trades. They traded Paul Rabel, face of the league, founder of the league, to the Cannons Lacrosse Club before their expansion draft. They also traded Ryan Brown, who's considered one of the best shooters in the league uh, to the water dogs. And we talked about last episode, the water dogs were kind of missing that guy who could uh, put goals in the net for them. Yeah. So this is a big pickup for the water dogs for sure. And uh, obviously the cannons getting Rabel is it's almost fitting. Like we said, because uh, we talked about it last week where the cannons are, we thought it was kind of interesting that the cannons were the expansion team because they were, Rabel's prime primary team and now Rabel's going back it's like he's kind of coming home he's like been the face of this sport for a long time and the Boston Cannons are where he made his name so that's a big big pickup for the Cannons so they get a really really good player there and then they still have the opportunity to take 18 really solid players who were left unprotected and then again last week yeah Ryan Brown like he's a uh, what do you call it? like one of those if you follow the east coast eyes on instagram he's an east coast eyes athlete or he used to be and they used to just put videos of just him picking corners that's all he did was go into their warehouse and pick corners on their targets and stuff so this is a big like we again we talked about it last week that the the water dogs were just missing that little piece on offense and especially like having to leave ryan drenner unprotected this is a good way to supplement what could be a loss for them yeah, man, I really liked both trades for all the teams involved. I think for the Cannons, it's a great PR move to have the face of the league and a guy who has connections to the Cannons uh, come in and be their first player on their team. 
Um, and I also really liked it for the Atlas because they fully committed to a rebuild and that's what they needed to do. We talked about it last week, how it's kind of funny that they were the worst team in the league and name wise, they were seen as one of the more stacked teams in the league. So they really needed to do something different. Um, so I'm glad they fully went for the rebuild and, uh, they started with the Pinnell trade. And they started with leaving some guys off to waivers. Kyle Hartzell, Callum Robinson, they left on waivers. Uh, But this is a whole other level of fully going for that rebuild. Uh, So it's good to see. And one big advantage is no other team in the league is rebuilding right now. Every other team um, has a chance to win. So they kind of have a step up on other teams. Yeah, they're truly the only sellers in the league right now. And if everybody's buying you can really capitalize on what you have to offer. Mm-hmm. So like moving Rob Pinnell and Paul Rabel, you know, arguably the two best players on their team or the two faces of their team, name recognition wise, at least it kind of sets the tone going forward. Like, yeah, like for the Atlas fans out there, you may have a, a rough time this year, but you're going to have a really young team and you're going to have a really exciting team. And that's well, like, I, I honestly don't think they'll like be as bad as they were even you know, going for that rebuild because Pinnell wasn't working for them. You know, he had a really low shooting percentage compared to the other ex-attackmen in the league. And Paul Rabel had a horrible shooting percentage in the bubble last year. He shot 5%. And in his first year, he was second in uh, midfield assists in the whole league. But um, the second year, like, he just could not, um, yeah, get his shots to go in. Um, so, I mean, the Atlas had a lot of struggles, so it's hard to just like put that on him. Uh, but yeah, he was, both those guys weren't working for the Atlas and for them to decide that's not working. We can move these guys and get some picks going forward. Uh, I think was a really good decision. It definitely gives them like a, a fresh start and a fresh perspective on what hasn't been a successful start to their history in the league. So it's, it's actually like an, ex- it, it's an exciting time. Like I said, like you may not have immediate success. Like, like you said, they're the only team rebuilding. So if everybody else is trying to win, like it's a kind of a, a log jam, like the whip snakes are probably still like mm. the top of the league and the red boots are still like right, right behind them kind of, but this really like kind of gives you the opportunity to stockpile a lot of talent going forward with all these extra picks and all these, and they're all high picks Like they have the first overall pick and they just picked up more first round picks and they're not really having to protect these guys in expansion draft. So the guys that they like, they just have so many less guys like that they have to leave unprotected. Yeah. And I think, you know, everyone's has a chance to win now. And Alice is saying, no, we're going to try to win in a few years. You know, other teams might not be in the same spot they are now as in a few years. So like that'll help them uh, when that time comes too. It's we talked about last week too how like the water dogs don't have that advantage of being built with that chemistry. Mm-hmm. And the more you see these these big trades and these uh expansion teams, like every team is starting to kind of lose that core. So it kind of even out it's gonna to start to even out like the the playing field a bit when it comes to that aspect of it. Definitely. Yeah, and I, I liked Ryan Brown of the Water Dogs too, because I think he just fit well. Like you could tell. Like, you know, where they took a guy like Zach Carrier, they're not a team that really wants a crazy ball dominant star, um, but they got a guy that can just finish all the plays they set up in Ryan Brown. So where last year, you know, they didn't have a guy to go to when they needed a goal. Now they have that guy of whatever play we create, it's going to end with a shot by Brown. Yeah, and look, seeing from him, it kind of, and this is going to be a bit of a loose comparison, but it reminds me of having a guy like, like Drew McDonald when we played at Dow or Patty Quinn. Like these are shooters, and they fit. They score a ton of goals because they shoot the ball so hard and so accurately. I remember when we were at Dow, like we did the power play, and we'd run our one play three, and it was you drive popped out to Drew. Oh, there he is, wide open, ripping a shot goal, and that's what kind of Ryan Brown brings. Yeah, shoot, shooting such a skill, man. Like it's it's so fine tuned that you know there's not a lot of guys that can really pick those corners, and 
when you do have a guy like that, like it really changes your offense. Yeah, it's a completely like invaluable to have. Like that's why snipers, like in any sport, are are so rare mm-hmm. and so so special. All right, so what the Atlas did is uh, pick up some more picks for the expand or the entry draft and college draft, uh, which are going to be going on. Uh, later in a few weeks but right now uh, this week coming up is the PLL expansion draft so we're gonna preview that for you guys now Uh, so they let out their uh, unprotected and protected list for uh, the other seven teams in the league this week you can find that on the Premier Lacrosse League's uh, website or their Instagram page and uh, Brett what did you think of uh, the list uh, well, the first thing that came to my mind with the list is like uh, there was a lot. I noticed a lot of uh, guys. I remember reading some of the the mocks about like, oh, who might get protected. A lot of the these teams, uh, some of them are really willing to part with young talent and keeping veterans. Yeah. Like the the Chrome, for example, put two high profile rookies on the unprotected list, and like in Macadet and Reese Eddy. Yeah, and. Those were, I mean, you can only protect so many guys. I understand they they have good chemistry in their attack line. You may want to, and you have to let them go. But Reese Eddy was, he started almost, played in almost every game for them. And he was a rookie and he was super effective last season in the bubble. And I was shocked to see his name on the unprotected list. Yeah, he was a no brainer pick for me too. We'll get into our picks in a little bit, but yeah, no, good call on that. Uh, I definitely noticed there were a lot of younger guys that you know, teams were more willing to let go of. And I think it's part to do with, you know, older guys have more of a role cut out for them. And while these younger guys might have uh, like the talent, they don't have the role on the team made for them yet. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good talent left available. Yeah. I should explain too, that like, even like, for people who may not be familiar with the way the PLL does expansion, like in the NL and L Jesus in the NHL, when the Vegas and like with the upcoming Seattle expansion with the Vegas expansion players on like a rookie deal are exempt from being placed there. That's not the case in the PLL. Every single player can be left unprotected unless you're military exempt. And some teams have guys who are military exempt. So which is an advantage. Yeah. Like that gives you an extra yeah. thought. I mean, it gives you an extra roster spot to keep a guy, but for some of these guys who are military exempt, like you're not going to get them next season because True. you're doing military duty. So it's kind of like, a, oh, we get to keep another guy, but we don't get this guy. If that makes sense. Yeah. And then, but like, so since everybody is like available to be left unprotected, like you do, some teams unfortunately do have to part with like guys they drafted last year and who were impact players just based on the rules of the, of the expansion draft. Yeah. And I, I think it was every team could protect 14 players. Uh, if I remember that right. Um, but yeah, that leaves, especially in a team in a league where there's, you know, seven teams about to be eight, like that leaves a lot of high quality players available. And I think two things that are really playing in to this expansion draft is that there's the MLL merger draft as well. So that doesn't normally happen that in an expansion year, you also get another pool of players to pick from. So the Cannons are in a really unique place. Um, they're an expansion team, but they can really go for it. And that's what they're doing or what they've shown that they're doing with the Paul Rabel trade is, oh, no, we're going to be good right away with the players that we can take in the expansion draft and in the merger draft and a loaded college draft because a lot of the co- college players – went back for an extra year of eligibility because of the COVID cancellation in their senior season. Yeah. One thing I just, we, when we were talking about the entry draft versus the college draft. So the entry draft is like, they, they used to do it every year where MLL players were declaring they wanted to come into the PLL. But now that they've merged that entire pool of players is eligible for this merger for this entry draft. And then there's another college draft in April for the NCAA players, as we said. So like, this is a, like an unprecedented off season where you can add talent so many ways. 
And yeah, like, and they, this, like, and, I, and I agree with you. The cannons, like, they if you have them at like the win now mentality, like this is just it just this situation just completely fell into your lap to win now. Yeah, and they don't have a first round pick in a college draft, but they have the first overall pick in the MLL entry draft and the sixth overall pick. And you talked about last week how instantly the PLL brought the majority uh, of the top players to their league. But one of the top players, Lyle Thompson, was still in the MLL. So with that number one pick, they're getting a star right away. And where the Water Dogs couldn't find that star in their expansion draft last year, um, uh, the Cannons already know that they have their guy uh, before this expansion draft even, even starts. Which draft is it that the Cannons have, uh, or that, that they get the snake draft? Is that the entry draft or is that the college draft where the Cannons are going to do a snake draft? I'm not sure. Well, one of the drafts, I think it's the college draft, but I could be wrong because I think they traded their pick. Yes, it's the college draft. It's the yeah. college draft. They were supposed. They traded their pick in the first round. They have a snake draft, so they get the second, the, the ninth pick overall, uh, which is the first pick of round two. And like you know, they aren't even in the league last year, so there's so many ways for this team to add talent to start right away. And like, and like you said, Lyle Thompson, like he is highly regarded as one of the best players in the world, top five for sure, and. For him to become available in an expansion draft is just a, like a gift from the lacrosse gods, which we discussed last week. They exist, man. And here's a situation of them acting favorably upon the Boston Cannons. But little reward for yeah, the Cannons winning the MLL in the final year. They get to come out with a star. And uh, actually, the coach for the Cannons Lacrosse Club in the PLL um, is the same coach who coached the Boston Cannons in the MLL last year. Yeah, that's a nice nod to to him. Sean Quirk has been an excellent coach for years for the Boston Cannons. He's been their coach since 2015. Uh, finished with a championship. It just made sense that he that he should get to keep that job and build mm -hmm. the team the way he sees fit. Because he is classified as by people know him as like a builder. Yeah, and I think where last year's expansion drafts uh, expansion draft the Water Dogs showed that they valued versatility more than anything where you had a completely new team you don't know where these pieces are going to fit and getting guys that can fit anywhere was really important to them i think we're going to see a different approach by the cans because they can go for like we talked about and they're just going to have a different mindset than what the water dogs did yeah i mean but the and again they get the luck of having the different talent pool to pick from the much mm -hmm. much like larger and then the one thing that is overlooked is the deep college draft, like you said, like because so many guys decided to play another season of college lacrosse, they're all coming out at once. So there's going to be a lot of guys like even later in the rounds that you're getting like impact players in a late round. Yeah, there's a lot of different strategies they could take. Um, the Water Dogs last year, they wanted to take – a team where they left the expansion draft and kind of had every position covered uh, to reduce their risk going into the rest of the off season. But yeah, the cannons, they could say, Oh, we can find a guy to fill that position. Um, and one of the other drafts um, you know, or they could balance it out. So was there anything when you did your mock expansion draft that you kind of prioritize prioritized? Uh, well, one, another thing I noticed too, was the, uh, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about it before, so many high quality short stick D mids were left unprotected. Yeah. And so it's like, I'm not gonna say I prioritize that, but I made sure to grab a couple of the, what I, what I believe to be the top tier guys and that of those, of that pool of players, the LSMs and the uh, short stick D mids, just because they're so valuable to a team. Like I remember I saw like, I texted you last year and I was watching the Redwoods like, I was like, oh my God, Jack Near is yeah, you called so that. underrated. He is so good at playing defense and creating loose balls. And then, you know, he was the 25th overall player in the league, ranked by the players. And of course, because he plays short stick D mid, that's probably lower than where he deserves to be. 
because that's just an unheralded position. You played it for a bit. It's not. It's yeah. Not a, yeah. There's no glory there. Like no, it's, it's really it's good at it. Complete work. You know. Yeah. As, so for those that aren't aware, in field across, you have six on six. You have four long poles and two short stick defensemen. So the long pole's job with the extra long stick is to turn the ball over. The short stick D is they're going to be attacked by the offense because they have a shorter stick and it's harder to defend with. So they're just coming at these guys and you can't try to take the ball away because you'll get yourself out of position, but you just have to work with the guy that's attacking you to not get beat and feed them into your defensive system so that your poles can come through and cause those turnovers. And yeah, so like, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, like, you know, you want to model your team after the top team in this league, and that's the Whip Snakes. And they ran with three unreal short stick defensemen last year. And they lose one of them in Ty Warner, who's uh, going to medical school this year. So they'll probably look to replace him. But they showed last year that like, they were the only team to protect all their defense. And they really showed the league that it's way easier to replace your offense than it is to replace some guys on defense. They kind of took the same approach this year. The only defender they left unprotected was Sean New. Mm -hmm. Who was and, a younger guy. Like he was a recent, uh, recent pick. Yeah. So another guy kind of victim to that new on the team, no defined role, but no they did the same thing. <laughs> yeah didn't get, gotta get get it up pretty early in the morning and get that one past you eh <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no pun intended that was completely accidental but uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah same same approach as last expansion they're keeping the their core defense together and their their core attack together do you want right. to break down individual teams here or yeah let's get into it so the rules for the expansion draft are uh, the team, the, the cannons can take a max of three players from each team, so the seven teams, and they're taking a max of 18 players overall. Uh, so mm -hmm. getting into some tricky spots where uh, some teams you want to take more than three players, but you can't, and you really have to, if you take some positions, then it affects the positions you take from other teams. Was there any team that you found the hardest to pick in your in your mock? Yeah, uh, the toughest teams for me were uh, probably the Archers and the Redwoods because I was there was a the few players like I'll just start with the Archers, the top team uh, alphabetically anyway. Like unprotected, they had Evan Connell, Chris Corley, who are both long poles, midfielder Josh Courier. Attackman Davy Amala, faceoff Brandon Fowler, goalie Adam Gittleman, defenders Jackson Place and Jack Rapine or Rapine, Joey Sankey is an attackman, long stick midfielder Michael Simon, and then Austin Sims in the midfield. Um, so right there, I like you know, there's like five guys that I wanted to take right there, <laughs> <laughs> and you can only take three, and you got to consider the position. So I found them pretty tough to pick because also I was considering like from some of the names that I recognized from college. Like I remember I texted you yesterday at, cause on some of the things Davy Amal is listed as an attack and on their things, they've listed him as a midfielder. And even though he hasn't seen like a lot of action, like I remember him from when he played in college and I was like, okay, well that's a really, really good name that's out there with a lot of potential. And I considered him, I think Adam Gittleman is the, the top goalie that was left unprotected. And because the chaos decided they were going to protect their their two starters. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the chaos and the archers were the only two teams that had two really good goalies. And, yeah, archers only chose to protect one. Chaos chose to protect two. Uh, for me, the hardest team to pick was the Water Dogs, actually. Um, really? I felt like the other teams went through the expansion last year. So they have already all kind of lost some players, whereas the Water Dogs were picking. They didn't lose anyone. So I felt like there was a lot of players um, and at positions I wanted to fill goalie face-off that really limited um, the other uh, players I could take that were 
really good players in the midfield and attack. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I thought the, the yeah the the Water Dogs like I think I was choosing between like two guys on the Water Dogs were were sure surefire picks for me, and then I kind of had to to balance. I think I ended up taking three from the Water Dogs. I did so. Uh, I didn't find them like as difficult, I guess, as you did, but I understand exactly what you're saying. Like, yeah, like they didn't lose anyone before. So their team is built like with the depth that they wanted. And now they have to kind of give some of it up. All right. So what's your three picks for the archers? My three picks from the archers were, uh, I picked, uh, Curtis Corley. I picked Adam Gittleman and I picked Josh Courier. Exact same picks from me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Funny. All right. Yeah. And no, I think everyone listening, uh, don't worry. Our picks are going to be posted uh, on Instagram later. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, I think Adam Gittleman, we kind of previewed it. Best goalie available as an expansion yeah. team that's going for it. You can't pass up on a serviceable goalie. And no. I actually thought about taking two goalies, uh, but just, just stuck with Gittleman as my one. Yeah, I didn't take two goalies because I know that uh, you can add that in the either the entry draft or the college draft. And there's also the waiver period. So if a goalie became available then, I think there's more time to add a goalie later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think that one goalie for now and kind of maximizing your depth in the field was the priority for me. But yeah, to get the good goalie when he was there. And like, so like, because I took Adam Gittleman, like Joey Sankey at attack, like he, he was one guy that I was kind of like, ah, you know, like if you're the Cannons, you evaluate what they have and you think, damn, like I kind of want him, but I value you know, Curtis Corley on defense may, is one of the top unprotected defenders. And yeah. Josh Curry is serviceable in the midfield, immediate impact player for them. I think that is a no brainer. Yeah, I like Curtis Corley. Yeah, like you said, very serviceable defenseman. I think he can definitely be a starter um, on the Cannons. Um, one guy I thought about on the Archers' defense was Jackson Place. So yeah. in the first year in the PLL, uh, the Archers had the best defense in the league, um, and Jackson Place was a big part of that. And near the end of the season, uh, he had a really scary neck injury. Uh, and has been rehabbing for a long time. And, you know, I, the second year, the Archers had the second worst defense in the league. I think that just goes to show his value. Um, but it is, you know, a bit of a riskier pick, a guy coming off a huge injury. Uh, but I really liked him and uh, thought he was a really good defenseman exposed as well. But, yeah, Curtis Scorley made a lot of sense. And Josh Currier, I think mean, Currier – um, is a guy that can be very versatile. And with all the star players available, I thought he was a great addition uh, to a team that, that's going to have a lot of star players where he can contribute but won't be kind of lost in the background. Yeah, I think for me, those picks just made sense. And uh, going back to Joey Sankey, like a very talented attackman, but I think I just went I just went a different direction at attack just with some of the other guys that were available and decided that the value for the cannons, if I was picking from the archers was elsewhere. And so yeah. he's going to stay with the cannons and allow them to have a more overloaded offense. Anyway, I'm sorry, the archers, Jesus. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Joey Sankey had like one of the nicest goals uh, in the league last year. He just, he's so, he's so small. His footwork's so good. He just, like made a guy just look both ways, made him turn around, ripped a shot. Uh, but he, uh, interesting story with him, he's actually a, a testicular cancer survivor too. And uh, he led, I think he still has North Carolina's uh, points record too. So yeah, really good guy that the archers will be happy to, happy to have back. Yeah, Joey Sankey, for those who don't know, we always call him a small guy. He's five foot five, 160 pounds. Like he's- yeah. But he's quick. But he's just so versatile. Like he's so slick, so quick, shoots so hard. And they, you know what? If if the the draft shakes out the way we think, the archers are lucky to keep him. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, so let's get into the atlas. So full rebuild mode. A little less guys available. 
but I was super shocked that Connor Busick was available. That was one of the bigger ones for me where I, I just couldn't believe that they would yeah. given what they have. But I mean, when looking at their midfield now, like they protected Joel Tinney, they protected Romar Dennis and John Crawley and Brian Costabile. Like, yeah, they treated those Romar guys make Dennis sense last year. So they yeah. weren't going to leave a guy they just acquired. Um, yeah. But no, I, I think Busick just has like such a hard shot um, coming out of the midfield that I was super surprised to see him. So he was a no brainer pick for me. Uh, and then the other pick I had just two for the Atlas um was short stick defenseman uh, Kevin Einstein KU uh I thought he's was one of the better short stick defensemen available I liked watching him and Alice only protected one short stick defenseman uh so I thought it made sense to to take him well we're five for five I had the exact same two picks nice the two from the Atlas yeah I thought about Brent Noseworthy because I know yeah. he was uh because he was I know he was a very impactful player he played at University of Michigan uh, he's actually was a box goalie. I played oh, okay. against Brent Noseworthy was I played in Hamilton and he played in Burlington. So we played a lot against against him growing up a lot. And like he was a very, very good box goalie, too. And one of the best in our league. And then he went and played midfield at Michigan. So I thought about him just because he's got the size and the athleticism. But uh, yeah, Connor Busick. And uh, again, Meg, we talked about the, the value of these short stick defensive midfielders like when they're available, you need to get them. So I think KU and uh, Busick for no-brainer picks for me as well. Yeah, and I honestly believe, so the um, Cannons are picking six, and yeah. I think they take another short-stick defenseman with that six overall pick in the NLR. Okay. Because there's two really good ones available in that range, in Zach Goodrich and Isaiah Davis-Allen coming over the MLL, and I think they try to do what the Whipsnakes did and, have three really good short stick defensemen. You're only as strong as your weakest link on defense. And if the guys that the offense is going to be targeting are super strong, it just makes that defense that much uh, stronger. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, analysis for sure. That was those guys uh, have been strong short stick defense, and these guys have value. Like I remember back when the ML Hamilton had an MLL team, uh, like Brian Hawkins, I think was his name. He played at Loyola, Maryland, and he was a, an absolutely invaluable short stick defensive midfielder. I remember I went to the national championship and Loyola, like Notre Dame was playing in final four. So like naturally had to go, went down to Boston, Notre Dame, Maryland, Duke, Loyola, and Loyola. And the final was Loyola and Maryland. And uh, Hawkins was just a machine. He was a noticeable player and he was a short stick defensive midfielder. So when these guys are good and they're available, you need them on your team. Because like you said, they are constantly targets and if they're good that's like so beneficial for your team it's almost hard to like fully describe if you don't quite know what we're talking if you don't fully understand like the dynamics of the short stick defensive midfielder and like the the way offense is set up in lacrosse it's it's almost it's difficult to describe how valuable they are mm -hmm. so when they're available you need to get good ones yeah all right, so let's see if we can keep our uh, same pick streak alive here with the uh, third team. To, yeah, yeah, that'd be funny. I, I can't imagine it goes the whole 18. That'd be pretty no, wild. No. Yeah. Uh, so Chaos, who you take? So my picks from the Chaos, I took uh, Deemer Class, Troy Ray, and uh, Miles Thompson, which makes and so much sense. He's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Miles Thompson makes a lot of sense because – if you know, you have to assume that the cannons with their first pick in the uh, the entry draft are going to take Lyle Thompson. For sure. And the chemistry that Miles Thompson and Lyle Thompson had when they were at Albany has not been replicated by Attackman since, really. And that's just a no brainer to pick those two guys, to pick Miles, to put him back together with Lyle. So that's why I picked him. I think Troy Ray, like, understand he's a long stick midfielder. So if you're trying to build defensive depth, that's not a bad place to start. You always need uh, athletes at that position. And then Deemer Class, just he was there. He was the top uh, midfielder available for uh, from the from the chaos. I really considered Tyson Bell because Tyson Bell, like, he's played for Team Canada. 
and I considered Dan Coates as well, but I get I went with uh, Ray just for the uh, the youth. Dan Coates is a little bit older, and uh, I already had a number of short stick defensive midfielders, so I didn't take Tyson Bell. But I I was like almost like hurt that I couldn't take him because he's such a good player. Yeah, I considered him as well. I think with class, we're seeing a similar thing with what happened uh, with Chaos trading Connor Fields. Was mm. class was very effective for them first year. Second year, he was injured and wasn't a part of their team. And I think Chaos just saw their team without Connor Fields as he was benched and without Deemer class as he was injured and liked their team as they went on their run and were more willing to let him go. But yeah, I thought he was a really talented guy uh, left available. And yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with uh, your other picks. And uh, yeah, I guess with all the good players available, it, it does make it easier to pick this expansion uh, from our eyes anyway, if we're picking the same guys. But we'll see if uh, we'll see when we finally uh, uh, go some separate ways here. Yeah, um, just one thing, another thing about Deemer Class, he's like Ryan Brown too. Like he's another solid shooter, but he's a midfielder. So uh, the threat from the two point is there. He's another like East Coast eyes uh, or ECD lacrosse athlete. So I've seen Instagram video upon Instagram video of him just absolutely picking corners in their uh, warehouse. So yeah, he has his own. Uh instagram page and kind of company called first class lacrosse and they do a lot of really good like drills and instructional stuff well young kids if you're listening make sure you go check that out because that guy can play lacrosse <laughs> <laughs> all right chrome who yeah who do you uh break who do you got from the chrome uh so from the chrome uh i thought attackman matt godet uh was a no-brainer he was super productive for them in his first year as a rookie. Uh, so I took him and I took short stick defenseman Donnie Moss as my other shorty D. Uh, uh, Chrome doesn't really have a super strong defense, but they like the Alice. They were one of the other teams that only protected one. So I thought Donnie, Donnie Moss made sense there. Is it just a two for you for them? Yeah. Oh, okay. So here's the difference. I took three from the Chrome. Mm -hmm. So I took, uh, I did took Macadet as well. Like, like you said, he's super effective. He's a uh, national championship uh, MVP. Yeah. Uh, at Yale. At Yale, former teammate, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I know. He's a good guy and a great player. So I picked him. Took, uh, like I was talking at the start, the start of the show, I was so surprised that, that they didn't protect Reese Eddy that I, I just had to take him. Oh, I, I took Reese Eddy as well. Sorry, I forgot about him. So, yeah. Ah, okay. Or, or yeah. Three, so, three. no. Yeah. Took Reese Eddy, and then I took Jake Pulver instead of Donnie Moss. Oh, okay. I can say Pulver, but yeah. I needed another long stick, and uh, I already I was considering some other shorties, and uh, okay. so, so yeah. I took him as a, as a full. So, we're we're off by one. Yeah. So, Donnie Moss and Jake Pulver. Those are I like the Donnie yeah, Moss. Uh, Reese like Eddy was another no-brainer, uh, similar yeah. to Troy Ray, just – talented uh, guy on defense yeah athletic guy that yeah, you can't pass up yeah i liked i liked the donnie moss pick mm -hmm. but i i just i went a different direction so like that's just uh i just needed more uh kind of close d guys Long yeah there weren't, there weren't a whole lot of uh close d available so i get the i get the jake pulver pick kind of had to take it when i had but all right, we got one one difference isn't bad. Great minds yeah. think alike, I guess. All right, on to the next. Redwoods now, eh? So the Redwoods were uh, another team that I struggled with just because I do um, kind of follow them the closest, so I feel like I've seen the most from them and know more about them than maybe some of the other teams. But mm -hmm. I went with... Uh, Hugh Krantz, Brent Adams, and Joe Walters. Okay. So a couple differences for me. Yeah. Um, so I did go with Brent Adams and Joe Walters. And mm -hmm. then I took uh, Halifax Thunderbirds, Clark Patterson. Clark Patterson. I, I, I did this a couple times. And in, in the first one, I took Clark Patterson. But, uh, again, just wanted the, def the defense depth. And uh, I thought – Hugh Krantz, like, is one of the better 
defenders left unprotected. Mm-hmm. And I said, again, like he's a Notre Dame player. I've seen him. I've watched him for years. I know how good he is. So he, for me, was like, oh, okay, he's a good pick. Nick Osello was another one that I considered because he is a short stick D midfielder. And he's like very, very tough. And like, you know, he has some some antics. I know he and Kyle Hartzell had like a beef for a while and Ray was really hyping it up. He made his back. back. Uh, yeah. That, uh, Kyle Hartzell made a bet with Nick, Nick Osello that he wouldn't uh, make a roster. But yeah. then because it was a bubble and they took an extra big roster, so he made the roster. So then Kyle Hartzell was like, no, like you didn't win the bet because the rules changed. So, yeah, there's a bit of beef there. Yeah, but Nick Osello played in every game for the Redwoods last year. And he's mm-hmm. like, it was a very effective short stick D midder, uh, D midfielder alongside Jack Near. So I did consider him again, but then I, I went with some other short stick D mids. Like I went with KU instead and uh, figured that they could add those guys in other ways. And that's kind of where I went with that one. But Joe Walters makes sense because he's, he's a veteran, he's been playing for so long. He's a threat to score from two points. He's a great playmaker, and he played great chemistry with Brent Adams, who's also a very effective midfielder. So those two made sense to me to be uh, to be together. Yeah, I-, I thought that was great to pair those guys and kind of have some instant chemistry going into the team. You can have them on the same midi line, and yeah, I think they just work really well as depth options. You know, they can fit anywhere, and yeah, veteran guys, like you said. And yeah, Clark Patterson, I think another thing, like I don't know if he'll be a starting attackman for the Cannons, but I think he can still find a role with them. And uh, he's a younger guy and uh, could have more of a role in the future. And that's and that exact reason is why I didn't pick him. Because I knew, I mean, I don't know for certain, but I you'd have to be assumed that the Cannons are going to take Lyle Thompson first overall. Like that just... Yeah, that is like it's, it's it just it's makes inevitable. the most sense. So if I already take if I take a full attack line and then they add the fourth, then Clark Pedersen for me would be the fifth attackman, and I felt like you could get a more value going in another way. And but I did consider Clark Pedersen at that spot. Great. All right. So who's up next? Water Dogs. Yeah. All right. So here's where I went for a face off guy. And I went for one second here. I can tell you, I went with uh, Drew Simino as well. Yeah, he was the no-brainer face-off guy, the only guy available who was over fifty percent in the bubble. And then I went with uh, Brody Merrill, and I went with Ryan Jenner. Yeah, so I had a bit of a hot take with the Water Dogs. Like I said earlier, it was the hardest um, team for me to pick. Okay. And I did go Brody Merrill. I think he's, you know, he's such a veteran defenseman. He's got an award named after him in the PLL. He's that good of a veteran defenseman. Even though he's getting older, uh, he's still a very effective ground ball machine. Um, but if the cans are going to be in win-now mode, they need a play caller on defense. And that's what Brody Merrill is. So he can really kind of organize the defense for them. And yeah, Drew Simino face off. Yeah, best face off guy available. You need to fill that position. So those were kind of took two choices away from me. And Ryan Drenner is arguably one of the top guys available, but I went a different route. And I think Ryan Drenner um, plays a really good way. And he is kind of like an offensive play caller. Um, but he did fall in the Water Dogs uh, depth a bit production-wise uh, compared to some other guys. So I kind of thought about that, and maybe he might be a lower producer as well. So where um, the Cannons trade away their next year's uh, first-round pick uh, in the Paul Rabel trade, I thought they might want to get a high-pick guy. And for me, that was Michael Krause. So Michael okay. Kroos was the third overall pick last year by the Water Dogs. So went Grant Ament, Brian Costabile, we saw light it up in the bubble. And then Michael Kroos opted to go to the to the MLL. 
Uh, and then with the merger, the Water Dogs still have his rights, uh, but they left him available. So I uh, took a gamble on Michael Kraus instead of uh, Ryan Drenner. Yeah, I mean, I understand the pick. I just went with Ryan Jenner. He's just a, a dynamic playmaker, and he was left unprotected last expansion draft because he kind of fell like by the wayside of the Whip Snakes depth because he was started with the Whip Snakes. And last year, I mean, yeah, like you said, the Water Dogs didn't really have that guy. They only protected two attackmen, and then they just traded for Ryan Brown. So there was, they obviously just valued depth elsewhere and i just think that he was kind of left to, like when i saw his name available he was he was one of a no-brainer pick for me in, in my opinion that i i just had to have him if he was available um because you know what you're going to get with him i mean i know michael crouch is a hot the top pick but considering he hasn't played in the league i think that's why i went with ryan drenner over say another attackman that they left unprotected I thought about Ben Reeves as well because Ben Reeves is a prolific goal scorer. But I went with Ryan Jenner just because of the the overall athleticism. Yeah, no, it, it's a good pick. It, it makes more sense now why he was exposed after the Connor Brown trade or Ryan Brown trade, sorry. Um, you know, so the Water Dogs added a guy to kind of fill him. Um, so yeah, it makes sense why he was left available. Makes sense why he might it'll probably be taken, even with me not taking him in my mock. It won't surprise me at all if the Cans do take him. Yeah, I mean, he's just an. It's interesting. Like, I think mean, there's a there's a not multiple guys in the list that's been unprotected twice, but he might be the biggest name that's been left unprotected twice now. And I just saw it and was like, you know what? He seems to have good chemistry wherever he goes, so I think you can add him on the cannons and, and have some success. So Whip Snakes, uh, last team here, uh, kind of not many people available um, on the Whip Snakes list. Yeah, only uh, only five players available uh, for selection. Anyway, I mean, if for those not keeping count at home, like we each only have one pick left or like based to get to 18 and yeah. i only the only guy i took from from the whip snakes was uh max tuttle yeah did you take max tuttle <sighs> i had him and then i and then i switched it at the very end uh so okay. yeah max tuttle like very good depth guy um but my thoughts on this were you know what do the whip snakes have and value and prioritize and that's defense and the guy they couldn't protect was sean new and he's a younger guy i think there's a lot of potential there um you know he was a former high pick and it's kind of like how you know when the new jersey devils were winning all their cups it was like oh if you get a chance to trade for a defenseman on the devils you know it doesn't matter who he is like you know, they have good defensemen and it'll turn out. And same thing with like the Nashville Predators. Like all they do is produce defensemen. So if you can grab one from them, it made sense. So that was kind of my, uh, you know, risky thinking on this one. But Max Max Tuttle does make a lot of sense. Yeah, I like the Chon new pick. And that was, I knew I was only going to end up probably taking one from the Whip Snakes anyway, just because of what I valued on the other teams, I guess. Hmm. And uh, for me, I went with six defenders like already. So I was like, I could use another midfielder. But uh, and Max Tuttle was, it was the best midfielder they left unprotected. And it's too almost too bad I couldn't take more from the Whips because they are the class of the league, right? You want to surround yourself with as many guys that have been with been doing that. But uh, no, I went with uh, with Tuttle just for the depth of, of the midfield and his it just his playmaking ability. Yeah, I think the reason the Whips didn't have a lot of guys available is because uh, they had a lot of guys taken in last year's expansion draft, and they just have such a solid core that of their players that they could protect. You know, they had everyone. Uh, yeah, they they no surprise protected that entire attack line. 
as well as uh, captain defense yeah. again. Yeah, their only loss, like I said, was Ty Warner uh, going to med school. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, they're Which, they're well managed, well run, well coached, and they're going to be you know the top team in the league again next year. Yeah, it's hard to see when uh, with the guys that get to protect and then not losing kind of an impact player how how they wouldn't be that's for sure all right so we'll have to see how we uh, fare on the actual expansion draft on uh, march 11th and uh, we'll see who had more correct picks and uh yeah just for bragging rights we'll have to yeah yeah we'll see how that goes all right moving on so I just wanted to talk about the we talked about last week with uh with Albany getting a new NLL team. They put a uh, a fan poll uh, on their their Albany NLL Instagram. So you go to the website and you can actually vote on their new name. Fans can vote on the new name. So the the options they provided are going to be the Albany Black Arrows, the Albany Firewolves. Or the Albany attack, and for me last week when I said I think it should be the attack, uh, I look at the the names like the Black Arrows and the Firewolves. Okay, I get it. Like they used to be the New England Black Wolves, so they're kind of maybe throwing homage to there. But it looks to me like they just put two garbage <laughs> options next to the next to the attack, so that they would just pick the attack. So I'm going to use what little influence I have over the podcast listeners here. Go vote for the attack because that is just so much better of a name. It's already been a team. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm sure why I'm getting so worked up over it. To be honest, but it's it's that's a no brainer. Like the the black arrows, the fire wolves. Like get real. It's the attack. Come on. Yeah. No, I, I don't think there's any way they don't call them the attack again. It. Yeah, that would blow my mind. Yeah. But uh, no, and the, the NLL posted on their Instagram, the their own Instagram, like last week. I don't know if you want to dive into this for like a, a couple minutes. Could be a good discussion topic about. It says where should where should the NLL expand next? Oh, so if they're already thinking about expansion, like uh, we talked about this. Do we? I don't know if we talked about it last week, but I've said it many times. Like there has never been a better time to be like a kid playing like bantam or peewee lacrosse than right now. The way this league is expanding and the way the junior leagues are valuing these new like box across talent. Like there are so many opportunities to keep playing box across and the way that and the NCAA is constantly adding new field lacrosse teams. There has never been a better time to be playing lacrosse and to be focusing on it as a sport, as a future opportunity creator than right now. So to get back to the discussion, where should the NL expand next? They've listed Baltimore, Boston, Charlotte, Chicago, Edmonton, which already had an NLL team for a while, Hartford, Kansas City, Montreal, Ottawa, Quebec City, Phoenix, Seattle, Tampa Bay, and Winnipeg. Any of those jump out to you? It was like where where might be a good option? One I would like to see would be Chicago. I think yeah. we've talked about, you know, there's pockets of lacrosse. You know, it's a very northeastern sport. And they're trying to take it west. And I think going to a big central city like Chicago would do a lot uh, to help that expansion. Um, so, yeah, that was, the, that was the city that jumped out to me. How about you? So, a lot of, I'm looking at this list, a lot of these teams have already had NLL teams, like the Bostons. Boston had yeah. the Blazers. Chicago had the Chicago Shamrocks back in the day. Montreal had a team in the, in the 80s or 90s. The Montreal. Oh, really? Teams. The storm, yeah, they only lasted like one or two seasons, but they already had a team. Uh, see, with the with the sports expansion, like kind of going on in like, Seattle, like they with that new arena and stuff. Seattle was an interesting one to me because it's close to Portland, which also used to have a team. But uh, and Edmonton obviously had a team, so a number of these cities were were places they've already been, but I know a lot of reading the comments, a lot of people think that Tampa Bay would be a good one. And I know back before in the old days of the NLL, before Nick Sakowitz took over, they expanded a little too quickly and they moved the New York Titans to Orlando and it didn't really work out, but uh, done right the way that they've expanded these other teams before and they've expanded the 
right. I think Tampa is an interesting one as well. Yeah, Tampa is slowly becoming a major sports city. You know, you have the Buccaneers win, you have the Lightning win, you know, the Rays are always competitive. <laughs> Brad's yeah, I've been a Buc- the Buccaneers, if you didn't know. I've been a Bucks fan since like 05 or something. I put up yeah. a lot of crap, a lot of crappy football before Tom Brady came and saved us. <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. The former Tom I like Brady, the- you're loving him now. Oh, when this that's a discussion for another <laughs> another day. But uh, Canadian Chicago, team, yep. Canadian team of that list. What would you like to see for a Canadian um, team in the NLL? So Ottawa is interesting to me because that's a city that's just just starting to kind of boom with lacrosse. Like they're just kind of getting like it reminds me a lot of Halifax where it's slowly getting more popular and you could really jumpstart growth by moving a team there. The Saskatchewan rush were formerly the Edmonton rush. So getting Edmonton and they did really well there. Like, I mean, Saskatchewan is just, they just love their teams, but Edmonton was interesting. I'm not sure about Quebec teams because from what I've experienced lacrosse just isn't quite as big in Quebec. But I think moving a team just to infuse growth is not necessarily the best idea. So I think Ottawa is the most intriguing to me uh, of the Canadian teams on that list or Edmonton just because of the history. Yeah, I remember uh, in Nationals and Whitby, uh, Quebec was not not so strong of a team the year I went. Uh, But I think if you did go to Quebec, you know, you'd be trying to do like the CFL model of like football was never big in Quebec. And then they moved some CFL teams there. And now like university football in Quebec is huge. So oh, yeah. I think they've shown that it does work. Um, so it could work with lacrosse as well. Another thing too is McGill in, in Montreal is one of the top and most prestigious university programs in Canada. So there is like an influx of talent playing lacrosse in Montreal. Yeah. I think if you were talking talking about expanding to one of the teams in Quebec, I think I would look at Montreal over Quebec city um, to start for sure. But I think Ottawa is still the most intriguing one for me. Cool. One thing I uh, wanted to tell you, I checked last week when we were talking about which PLL team had the most fans. And okay. the Redwoods Lacrosse Club Instagram page does have the most followers. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Good call by you there. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Roll so woods. be sure to check out the PLL expansion draft for the Cans Lacrosse Club March 11th. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube usually. Uh, and yeah, see how we, we fared with our picks and, uh, thanks for, for listening. If you stayed this long and we're excited to bring you another episode next week. Yeah. Again, just want to shout out everybody. Thanks for the great response on, uh, the first episode and like kind of the excitement of the, the podcast. And we're looking forward to having each and every one of you on as guests. So find a time we're going to reach out to you. You can reach out to us and we're going to make it happen. And we're going to keep having fun talking lacrosse. Absolutely. All right. See ya. Yeah. See ya. Have a good one.